All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Klani, Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs. Thanks so much for joining us. Tonight's program is part of Architecture Everywhere, a monthly series organized by the Washington Architectural Foundation, exploring how architecture comes to life in unexpected ways through other arts and humanities disciplines. In this presentation, we welcome Dr. Henriette Rahusen, researcher and historian from the Department of Northern European Paintings at the National Gallery of Art here in Washington, D.C. Her career, Henriette, has authored numerous articles, conference papers, and exhibition brochures, in addition to contributing to several collection and exhibition catalogs. Tonight, Henriette, a Dutch native, will talk about architecture in Dutch painting. Before we begin, a note regarding your participation tonight. By participating in this webinar, you are granting your permission to be recorded and for the recording to be distributed as AIADC and the Washington Architectural Foundation may choose. If you have any questions or comments during the program, please use the Q&A and chat features and we'll follow up with those afterwards. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, Henriette Rahusen. Henriette, thanks for being with us. Scott, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, say a little bit about architecture in Dutch art. And I must say that I'm slightly miffed that you are outperforming me with, mint, with windmills as your background. But for the time being, I will let that slide. Before I start with the presentation, I have a few notes. Uh, it is probably best to make sure you are on full screen view because uh, I maximized my images and did away with fancy borders. So you will probably uh, get the most out of viewing things on a laptop by going full view. Make sure this works. Here we go. Okay. Um, There we go. Uh, and also, uh, you will receive a PDF of all the images I'm using with their various details. So you don't have to make uh, crazy notes and scribble away. So I hope you will enjoy this uh, ride through the Dutch architectural world of the 17th century. And I would like to focus in this lecture on architecture for art on the historical context of the Dutch art of the 17th century, architecture in art, architecture as art, and then finally architecture of art. And uh, if you bear with me, it will become clear. So architecture for art. We have to remember that none of the paintings and drawings and prints that you will see were created for view in a museum. So the National Gallery of Art West Building you see on the left and the East Building 75 are dedicated spaces for art that was not meant to be, it wasn't created for a museum world. I have the great pleasure to work in the East Building, but the collection of the Dutch and Flemish gallery, uh, collection is in the West Building. I will focus on the collection in the West Building, but I cannot go uh, before I say anything about I am Pass East Building, which uh, in itself is a work of architecture and uh, modern art and, or more recent art does beautifully in the East Building. Uh, but this is the last that you will hear about the East Building. In the National Gallery of Art, uh, we have a lot of people working together to create the beauty you see on the wall. One of them is your own colleague, Donna Kirk, who is the senior architect in our design department. And she and her team take care of making everything look good, both the permanent collection as the uh, temporary exhibitions that we, under normal circumstances, host very frequently. The West Building galleries were designed with specific collections in mind. So we have the Italian Renaissance wings uh, featuring a style of 
wall that the Renaissance works do well in. Here you see the wood paneling of the Dutch galleries. It is grand, it is ornate, it is classic uh, Western European style museum building. The large galleries are great for slightly larger art, but small cabinet size art that the Dutch also uh, excelled in would not, would, would not do very well on the walls of the main uh, gallery. So in 1995, they found unused uh, storage space and carved out three cabinet galleries that are uh, lower ceiling, more intimate scale, and the small art does beautifully there. So the architecture of the building in a way dictates what you can hang and what you cannot hang. The historical context of the works of art I will go through very quickly. When we talk about the Netherlands, the low countries, on your left you see the 17 provinces that uh, at some point through dynastic marriages became part of the Habsburg Spanish Empire. In the second part of the 16th century, the Dutch started the northern seven provinces uh, got together for a revolt. Uh, on and off, uh, the war was fought, but in the end, in 1648, on your right-hand side, everything above the red line became the independent Dutch Republic, and the other 10 provinces remained with the Spanish Netherlands. The Dutch Republic is very often called Holland, but that's actually a misnomer because only the province Holland is properly Holland. And uh, so it's a bit of a lazy use of an easier word, uh, but I just wanted to get this straight in everybody's mind, but it's not important. During the 17th century, the Dutch trading empire spanned the globe and it made this very tiny uh, new republic quite rich and the envy of many of their competitors. And they traded and were also the transport carriers for other nations worldwide. With the expansion of the economy came uh, an influx of immigrants, uh, people did well, populations, uh, especially of the larger towns in the province Holland, exploded. And of course, with an expansion of your population, you need more houses. And we can see that, uh, I'll go into that in a minute, uh, massive urban expansions. Where do you expand your places if you don't have much land to begin with. And I have to uh, uh, go back to Scott's windmills because using wind energy, the Dutch pumped low-lying marshy areas and removed water and create, created arable land and land that they could uh, build housing on. Uh, and probably give you a little, sorry, a little glimpse back. Everything that is not light green was at some point in the history of the Netherlands uh, created by man. The two maps on the, sorry, my fingers are too quick. The two maps on the right, uh, the two maps really illustrate this very beautifully. On the left, you see the province Holland with a lot of marshes and lakes uh, that over the course of about a century became poldered, i.e. became reclaimed. And uh, with the expansion of arable land, uh, agriculture also became and continued to be a mainstay of the economy. So one of the places that expanded is Delft, and uh, some of you may know Delft as the town of porcelain. Others may know it as the town of Jan Vermeer, but Delft is a nice example of a place where people felt extremely proud of their own city. And municipal governments all over the Netherlands 
commissioned painted images of their town to hang in the city hall, uh, like this view of Delft painted in 1615. So it's, it's uh, showing what you have for visitors and, and being proud of the place that you live in, more so than a national identity at this stage, we're really talking about a local, maybe provincial identity. People were so proud of Delft that uh, in the 1670s, somebody commissioned and created what is known as the figurative map of Delft, which consists of, I think, about 32 separate engraved plates, which put together give you a profile on the top, the map of the town in the middle, and surrounded by buildings of note in Delft and the, the harbor and some crests of the people who were uh, burgomasters at the time. The little circle comes uh, in play in two more slides. So Delft is uh, very happy with itself. This same map, just to show you the, the scale of what you would have hanging on your wall, uh, as part of the Cityscape show in 2009, it was mounted and was a very popular exhibit. So we have a profile of Delft at the top of this figurative map, and I wanted to show you the detail of the windmills on the ramparts, because Holland being super flat, a windmill needs to catch as much wind as possible, so you need to find the highest spot in the environment. And if you don't have a, a, a hill nearby, you put it on your city walls. So throughout the Netherlands, in the days when they still had the walls and ramparts, they would be dotted with windmills for a multitude of industrial purposes in addition to the traditional milling of grain or milling of timber. One of the images on the figurative map is a Dutch Renaissance style town hall designed by Hendrik de Keizer um, in the early part of the 17th century. He incorporated an older bell tower and Hendrik de Keizer, who hails from Amsterdam uh, was for the first 25 years of the century, the go-to architect of the Netherlands, and this was his building style. We also in Delft will encounter the little street, and for the longest time, uh, anybody, including Vermeer uh, experts, figured that this would be a imaginary town. Nobody had been able to, to really locate the little house of Vermeer until 2015 when somebody used, and this is for all you uh, tax historians out there, somebody used the dredging tax rolls of Delft to figure out that the exact size of two houses adjacent with two little uh, gateways the only way possible where they could be is at the Vlamingstraat. And then later on, somebody, uh, once they knew the address, said, oh, but that is where the aunt of Vermeer used to live. Apart from that historical factoid, it's a gorgeous painting uh, showing Vermeer's incredible facility with painting textures, painting space, and painting uh, human life as part of uh, this very tranquil type of scene. Inside one of those houses, it's not by Vermeer, it's by the Hope, but we could imagine that the interior of the house we just saw looks like this, simple but clean and effective, a bedstead in the house, in the main room of the house on the right, the uh, light coming in from the left, which uh, for those of you who wonder why most always the light in Dutch art 
shines in from the left, you just ask yourself how many of you are right-handed and how many of you would like light coming in from the right if you're working. So the right-handed painter makes the light come in from the left because that way he doesn't create shadow on his own work. Side note, you also will note the small landscape painting and even modest homeowners uh, during this economic uh, heyday would decorate their houses with art. So there was a mass market for art in various um, price categories and uh, there was an open market so you could just walk into a dealer and get yourself a little landscape. The framing of the interior and the lines and the 90 degree angles is fabulous. So is this painting again by Peter de Hoog where we have layers and levels and recessions toward the outdoors. Just a fantastic painting. Um, the, the, the tiling work in the Netherlands uh, and the brickwork is very logical because the Dutch rivers yielded plenty of clay to make bricks, but there are very few quarries in the Netherlands. So stonework in buildings would have been imported. As would wood, because the Dutch landscape had very few large forests. So the wood would normally come from the Baltic Sea area. It's a great, it's a, it's a wonderful painting. So, um, Oh, the tiles, uh, Scott, when we talked earlier, said what's going on at the bottom in the center. Uh, so instead of a kickboard, you had kick tiles uh, in the Netherlands with little figures uh, as decoration. So we turned to, from Delft, we turned to Amsterdam, which over the course of uh, 150, 200 years, really expanded, exploded to become what is known today as a world heritage site, UNESCO heritage site, the canal zone. We start with a view, a bird's eye view of Amsterdam in 1538. And please note that the first hot air balloon did not go up in the air until I think 1783 or so. so Cornelis Antoni's zone imagined himself above the city. The river comes in from here, dives down. This is the dam or the lock in the middle of Amsterdam, and then it goes down here. 1538, completely imaginary, apart from the fact that the two-dimensional street scene that he knew is translated into a 3D rendering that he envisions in his mind. Oddly enough, about a hundred years later when the city, and we'll see that in, in, in a minute, the city had already expanded dramatically, but Micker goes back to the situation of uh, 1538, but paints in 16, about 1652, amazing. In addition to the bird's eye view, he imagines himself to be between the clouds. So the, the play of the shadows of the clouds over the landscape and over the town is, is breathtaking. And again, you think how in the world did they come up with that scene never having been that high up? Again, the river, the Amstel. And here is downtown, again with the river and the center of town with City Hall, one of the churches. So this is the situation of 1538, but painted at a later stage. In the time that Micker actually paints his work of the older version, the town already looked like this. So the expansion 
uh, they had three expansions already, most of it on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. And of note are, again, the river. Of note are three artificial islands. So if you need more space for uh, shipyards and warehouses, you just create yourself a couple of more islands. And noteworthy, what I talked about before, on the ramparts, the windmills that did various um, various types of uh, pre-industrial work. And here are a few of those windmills on the ramparts. So it's clean energy in the 17th century. So the windmills today, there's nothing new about it. They, the, the old ones look a little prettier for sure. Let's go back to the downtown center. And uh, first I would like to focus on the new building on the left. So we have the old city hall in the center and then we have this new building uh, built on top of the lock of, uh, that covers the river. And if you are a mercantile empire, you need a stock exchange or at least that's what they uh, considered they needed. And again, Hendrik de Keizer designs and builds a stock exchange on top of the covered river. Here's the interior of the stock exchange. The Dutch Renaissance style is, is quite obvious. And we will soon contrast the Dutch Renaissance style with uh, something else. But here is another building that Hendrik de Keizer designed, probably designed. We're not 100% sure. Somebody bought a double lot in the bend of the river. So the, actually the facade of the building is slightly curved toward us. And then in 1670, Jan van der Heide uses this building that we just saw and he paints the house with the rear portion of the house peeking above the roof of the other one. And he paints it next to the Haarlemmer Sluis. And you look at this and you think, wow, that is such a realistic painting. And uh, if I could time travel, I could visit this location and it would look exactly like it. You would be wrong because in this case, the house on the little bend is here and the lock, Haarlemmer lock is down here. So van der Heide merely joins two elements that he knew well and in his studio creates something that we would consider super realistic, but it's not. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way. My apologies. Back to City Hall. The Dutch had for the long, or the Amsterdamers had for the longest time used a compilation of older medieval buildings as uh, their city hall. But in a booming economy and a, an emerging republic, uh, it really was no longer at the level that people felt uh, reflected the status of the Dutch Republic. So already in the early 40s, the municipal government decided to build a brand new structure. Sandre Dom is one of the specialists in Dutch architectural art, and he takes five days and makes a very detailed drawing in 41. In 57, so much later, he paints the same scene. And he writes on the awning exactly what he did. Problem for those who are punctual about real, realism is that in 1657, this place no longer existed, 
because it had gone up in flames in 1652. And they had already started building the new uh, classicist town hall, the architect Jacob van Kampen. And I mean, the difference between the old medieval compilation of buildings and this grand classicist uh, building uh, couldn't be greater. And you will appreciate how grand and imposing it is if you compare the old structure next to the new structure. The building was occupied in about 1655 and the cupola was used, was uh, finished a little bit later. The back of the town hall with an equally imposing uh, facade along one of the canals was drawn by Gerrit Bergheide, the most accurate, I would say, of the exterior painters of Dutch art in the 17th century. The date, the, sorry, the drawing is undated, but we know that his first effort um, of painting this in his studio is the one on the left. And we know this because these houses in, in the drawing over here, these houses were still gabled, uh, step gabled in the 68-70 era, but by 1686, the gables had been modernized and the whole scene is uh, slightly different, even though Berkheide still used his original drawing as his studio template. You can also note that, yes, he is true to the buildings, but the local scene and what he built, what he paints people-wise is uh, pretty much imaginary. Uh, because this is a much better uh, image than anything that is drawn, I wanted to share you the design of the town hall by Van Kampen. And you can see that the two courtyards flanking the center citizens hall provide light at all four sides of each of the two halves of the building. And we just looked at the rear of the town hall in Berkheide's paintings. The front of the photograph is where the canal used to be and the canal was filled in, in I think the late 19th century. The citizens hall is uh, a sort of the image of power. It is grand. On the floor are three maps, two are the northern and southern hemispheres where the Dutch traded, and the third is the celestial map with zodiac symbols by which the captains of the ships most likely did most of their navigation. You can still visit uh, the city hall. It was appropriated by the Napoleonic uh, kings in the early 19th century, so it's now a royal palace, but uh, I always consider it the city hall. From the cupola of the city hall, another painter, Jacob van Ruisdaal, around 1665, when they're still finishing up the cupola, draws this scene looking down toward the harbor. And we have to realize that what he sees and what he paints again the sky is imag not imaginary but he, he doesn't draw the sky in his drawing he limits himself to the the, the 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 urban scene and then in his studio he comes up with this majestic sky but if we put the two pieces together we see that he was very true to what he draw. And we also have to realize that this is the first actual view down onto the city that uh, we have in Dutch art. So the two earlier versions that I started with are imaginary. This is Van Ruisdaal actually looking down onto his own city. The third of the famous architectural painters is Jan van der Heide, and he 
we now get into the question of okay is architecture the main show or is human life uh in front of the architecture the genre scene is that the main show in a painting and with Jan van der Heide it it tends to be a blend but here we have the the old church the outer kerk um again with superb light by the way it never rains in dutch art uh, for all of those who wonder um, it's always sunny so that's that's not realistic here we have a detail and uh, focusing in on the daily activities of humans uh, we may be in front of a brewery uh, people go about their daily lives the woman is leaning over her half dutch door exquisite brickwork and stonework and the details are really uh, 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 lovely to behold the little detail of the bells in the in the bell tower is uh, an added bonus so it's a realistic view of the outer kerk but hidden behind the trees and uh daily life takes place in front of the church like it would officially have done also a scene of daily life in which architecture clearly is a mere backdrop is the vegetable market in the 60s but we can imagine that one of the houses um, designed by Philips Wingbombs in 1639 uh would be one of the houses behind the people in the vegetable market why are the canal houses so narrow well you paid your taxes based on the uh, number of feet that fronted the the, the canal the k uh, so the narrow house was the way to go here is uh, an image on the left from uh, architect Wimbom's self-published portfolio uh, this is called the white house which still stands so amsterdam has a white house as well and here you get um, a good idea of uh, the voorhuis the front of the house the courtyard that provides light for the rear house this actually is a fairly small house but uh, this image is a photograph obviously of the houses along the Herengracht with a front house the courtyard the air and the light shaft and the passageway followed by the rear house so the lot size was 35 sorry 30 feet wide and then 190 deep but on the opposite side on the Keizersgracht they had the same structure so your gardens are two times 80 is 160 feet and only your 110 feet uh, allowance was for your building you could go uh, up unlimited so you could have four stories but very few houses had more than uh, four so th there was a very clear structure and and the regulations were were very clear and the Herengracht was always designed as a residential area which means that they allowed for the larger gardens and um, so sort of city palaces the Amsterdamers were certainly proud of their canal zone even in the the later centuries and in 1768 somebody published a compilation of drawings of uh, about 1400 houses flanking the Keizersgracht and the Herengracht including the house that we just looked at the White House which is Keizersgracht 319 and you can still buy uh facsimile copies of this Grachtenboek and it's used for people who do restoration work they can go back and consult the Grachtenboek uh how it might how it looked in the uh, 1768. 
So by the late 17th century, the canal zone pretty much looked the way it uh, looks today. I mean, in, in the buildup. Um, and here is a map of 1721 that shows you the rings and it shows you where the, the last extension started. So the old expansion had stopped here and then they literally went around the bend. And this is called the Golden Bend because it had the biggest houses and the most uh, ornate architecture. Gerrit Berkheide, who's also the one who painted the city hall, draws the Golden Bend uh, around 1671-72. And we know this, the timing, because in those years, if we look at the painting that he made, these lots had not yet been filled. We know that uh, from the, the building books. But he's, he paints... Uh, He's true to his uh, probably detailed oriented self. And by the late 80s, this wider light area is filled in because they have built another house on the corner of the street there. So you can, you can follow the building of the Golden Bend houses through the work of Berkheide um, beautifully. Now he doesn't paint any people. Uh, there are a few people, sorry, my hand uh, messed up. There are a few people here uh, on the K for scale, but he doesn't paint any additional trees or embellishments. This is the type of house that uh, would be present in the Golden Band in the, in the classier areas of uh, the Herengracht and Keizersgracht. By this time, the lot width in this particular area had become bigger. Again, this is a design by architect Vingbooms. And note for those who didn't want to get their feet wet if it ever flooded, that only the cellar area would, would get wet and the bel étage would be above the floodplain. Like this bel étage in a gorgeous painting we have at the National Gallery of Art. Note the, not only sort of the, the planes of squares and uh, doorways and see-throughs, but also the marble floor, imported stonework, uh, landscape paintings on the wall, and a proud mama and papa in the background looking at a first act of charity of what people say is a little boy still in leading strings. This, these are the leading strings, by the way. And the outside and the inside world are here joined, but it's an imaginary scene, but it really conveys a sense of the interior of these uh, more uh, elaborate and, and richer households. So then we turn to architecture in landscape paintings. And um, sometimes the landscape is dominant and you only know that you're looking at Dordrecht because you recognize the outline of the, the large church. Sometimes we have an imaginary landscape uh, with a Vingbooms type classicist building. Sometimes we have an actual sugar mill that Frans Post drew when he was in Brazil in the 1640s. And after he returned home, he created many Brazilian landscape paintings based on his drawings. And the same sugar mill and Frans Post image returns in a gorgeous map of uh, Jan Blau first used as a book illustration and then included in his amazing Atlas Meyer of 1667. So the, the image is reused. The imaginary Italianate landscape that makes you think of uh, a glorious relaxed afternoon in the vicinity of Rome. We have an actual bridge still standing in Rome today, the Ponte Molle. 
which looks like this on this side, but in here, Jan Asselijn has combined a drawing he did of the actual bridge with a mausoleum uh, dating back to the first century that he felt was more picturesque. So again, we have realism that is not real, but it's a compilation of things that are real. And we have totally fantasized landscapes such as this uh, Palladio style building uh, in a flat landscape. Nobody has been able to find the house, so we think it's imaginary. And this one is a, a very uh, good example of the architectural uh, designs and compositions of very otherwise uh, simple looking paintings. Uh, please note the pediment uh, of the main house and look at the lines and they parallel the uh, road to the drawbridge. They, uh, they have 90 degree angles to the, the main man walking through his archway. The red line hits the guy exactly. This 90 degree angle hits a spot that I will show you in a minute. But this one I think is the absolute best. This line that aligns with the pediment hits the only bird in the sky uh, of the painting. So if you were to look at the painting in the National Gallery today, you would have to stand there quite a long time because before you would figure out that, wait a minute, there's a lot going on here. Uh, but it's very much fun to try. This is a compass point in the center of the archway that is still there after all these years. Nobody luckily has uh, restored it out. So again, here is the compass point. And I find those things totally cool, but then I'm a geek about stuff like that. So architecture as art, the specialist who really made the building their prime subject. Sandrodam we already saw as the uh, painter of the Amsterdam City Hall, but he derives from Haarlem and draws the big church in Haarlem and it was turned into a print into a book in 1628. One generation later, again, Gerrit Bergheide paints this amazing work that shows off the city pride looming over the marketplace uh, in all its glory with all its different textures and building uh, materials. Yes, there are people uh, providing scale in the lower, lower area, but clearly the building itself is the, the main draw. The shadows correspond to the time of 1.40 p.m., depending, of course, on uh, the time of year. But the building is the, is the subject of this work of art. So he paints the ex exterior, but Sandredam, a generation earlier, had already uh, done this large imposing work of the interior of the church. And only when you know that we have a hand-drawn, freehand drawing that he did in 1635. We have an undated watercolor drawing of the organ of the church. And we have two of the four surviving, two surviving drawings with grid lines that made transposing uh, it onto canvas much easier uh, with, on, with instructions that he sort of draws for himself and the vanishing point on the one on the right. So, the one painting is based on uh, a total of six, sorry, five, five different works, two, four, sorry, six, six different drawings to make one painting. So again, it is 
the reality, but it is a bit of the reality skewed to turn into one likely painting. And then the last little bit is uh, something I've only recently become more attuned to. We already looked a little bit at uh, Van der Heide and his architectural fantasy, but the use of the golden ratio um, in art, including the so-called Fibonacci spiral that uses is based on those perfect proportions. This recent acquisition at the gallery is a Mary company. And you start to think, well, okay, is anything else going on? And uh, you have to forgive me the COVID related homework that I did with the drawing. But here we have the shoulder of the woman, her eyes, the eyes of the man, perfectly aligned with the spiral. The shoes of the two main characters are part of the spiral. Uh, so this works. However, we're not done yet. We also have, starting with the line through the center of the lute, the nose of the cello player and the rim of the, the fold of the man's hat. And we start looking at 90 degree angles and we start looking at parallels. Uh, we start looking at the, the, woman, the woman's leg, the bow arm, and the point of the cello and the elbow of the woman. So you start to think, okay, did he really, was he really this mathematical before he started painting? Or are people uh, innately drawn to things that... Uh, are mathematically, uh, that feel mathematically right. And the last one, you would not think that you are looking at architecture of art, but uh, here we have, again, a very recent acquisition, a little blue butterfly above a couple of medlars. It all starts with the bottom level of the stone table and uh, the diagonal from the top left and lower right corner and then you start matching it up and you think again did he map this out before he started painting or am I seeing things that uh, I make I'm making stuff up I would I would say that if you have a line that perfectly uh, aligns the parallel to all the elements of the leaf, the top of the bunch and the end of the leaf, I think it is not happenstance. And uh, if you look at art, uh, the next time you're in a museum, I would say architecture is everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henriette. Uh, that um, <laughs> architecture is everywhere, ties in perfectly with our whole series. So um, uh, how true that is. And um, uh, I think you really took us uh, to a different time and place um, with your presentation. So um, I commend you for that and thank you for that. Um, so for the audience, um, if anyone has any questions, please um, use the Q&A feature now. Um, I'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, let's see here. Um, a second. All right, let's see. So uh, Henriette, as a Riverside trading town first established in the Middle Ages, what was it like growing up in Deventer? Um. It's, it's one of those things you don't realize it as a kid because it's normal. And uh, I was going to uh, stop, but I knew that you were going to ask this question. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it felt very normal. 
the you, you bike around town and you pass uh, an old church that was built in the in the 14th century and it's just the church of town and as a teenager you go to a bar and it just happens to be in the cellar of a medieval uh, medieval building with some so it's normal but if you look back or you 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 remove yourself from from that moment you realize how unique it was to be surrounded by by so much history uh, architecture wise right um and um Here's another question. Uh, is there one Dutch painting or set of paintings considered to be most valuable, popular, or emblematic of Dutch heritage? Um, I would say that that really depends on who you ask. If you ask that question of uh, a historian, uh, he or she might say, oh, it must be a maritime painting that shows a big battle where the Dutch beat the English or they bring back the cargo from the Far East. Uh, if, you ask, if you ask a, a foreign visitor, they might say, oh, it is one of the works of Vermeer. Um, if you ask an architect, if you ask an architect, they might say, oh, it's one of the works by Berkheide because he, he really let me know what it looked like in those days. So um, I, I don't think you can put a lot of money on it because sometimes it's, it's, the, it's the national image that was built over centuries. And uh, do we believe our own storyline? Probably yes. But it's a very beautiful storyline. Right. So in the end, it really depends. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you could have great discussions uh, to, to answer that question. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Dutch actually went through an exercise last year or two years ago to, to establish which 50 or 100 works they consider to be the canon of the uh of the dutch painting world and i i didn't check all of them but it's i think it's sort of the yes the recognizable feel good oh beautiful stuff uh over made over the course of centuries good one of our attendees wants to know uh if the national gallery is open at this point uh, or if not when um so we can see some wonderful works uh your lucky day, and I will double check, but I'm pretty sure it is uh, the 15th of May. So let me double check this. Uh, no, it's opening uh, for the public, I think on Saturday, the 15th of May. And the West building main floor will be open. The East building with uh, more of the modern works won't be opening until probably early June, but they have to, they're doing it in phases to make sure that they can handle the, the, the COVID restrictions and the, the time. So people have time tickets for uh, starting uh, the May 15th, but they're still free, but you just have to make a reservation. Good. Donna Kirk chimed in saying the West Building opening on March, or excuse me, May 14th. Oh, May 14th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks, Okay, <laughs> she knows best. <laughs> um, excellent. And um, early in your presentation, um, you had um, given some context to the artists who um, imagined what cityscapes look like from overhead. So those aerial shots. Do you know what that process was for them to create that, and and what, um, how realist realistic the the community thought about those? Um, they were not the, the, okay. The Dutch were already very accomplished map makers, so the cartography of uh, towns was quite rigorous and and well thought out. So we have. I don't know about 1538, but definitely in the early 17th century, we have maps that were using the street views 
and they knew lot sizes and they knew dimensions. So highly accurate. I can't say that every every house was exactly the way it was, but people nowadays can still go back to a map of Amsterdam of 1625 uh, uh, that really shows you where things are, where the uh, shipyards were, um, the, the, the stonemasons uh, area. So the transforming this, the, the two dimensional that they were aware of and they knew into a three dimensional aerial view is, is the amazing part. But the accuracy, I think, of, of what you are looking at building-wise is, I think, is there. Right. And to kind of follow up with that, um, so we know the term Dutch realism, but are there other terms um, that are used um, to, um, I don't know, act as a, not, I don't want to say the word disclaimer, but in a way or a statement, um, like if you're putting together an exhibition or a catalog, um, do you have to give context that these paintings aren't entirely accurate. Yeah, we, I think people, if you, if you do a quickie, you say, oh yeah, that's the way it looks. But if you're honest to yourself and to your audience, you say, like we saw today, they made drawings, but even a drawing is already an artist on the spot interpretation of what he what is he uh, jotting down and what is he omitting so one of the things you don't see in a lot of these paintings is the grime and the dirt of a large city with too many people squished together uh, in in a single spot so um, again are the big buildings faithfully rendered yes but so it, it, we, we do offer the disclaimer that all, these works were all studio works. The, the, the painting in the uh, plan air painting uh, was only developed or people only started doing that in the 19th century. The drawings are eyewitness interpretations. The paintings are all studio works, which is also why you can get one drawing and in the case of Berkheide, five or six or seven versions of a, the same scene with little tweaks of different people in different positions. Good to know. Um, we have two uh, questions from the audience. They're uh, related to your uh, mathematical analysis, um, which was really fascinating to me personally. Um, so the first one is, are you aware of Le Corbusier's regulating lines and what connection do you see uh, to what you are looking at uh, in alignments? Sorry, I didn't catch the first part of the question, Scott. Um, are you aware of Le Corbusier's regulating lines? No. <laughs> That's a, that's a very easy one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, you have to ask Donna. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one's from Mark McInturf. Thank you for chiming in with that. So oh, maybe Mark can uh, Mark, enlighten, Mark, enlighten uh, us. Mark and I had kids together in nursery mm -hmm. school. So hello, Mark. Good to see you. <laughs> good, good. So to follow up on that, uh, was the Fib uh, Fibonacci series frequently in use in Dutch art and architecture? Well... That's the that's the fascinating part. I've I've started to see the spiral in not all but quite a few paintings, but and and the mathematical principle of the spiral and the golden ratio was very much known in the mathematical sense, but none of the art treatises written in the late sixteenth early seventeenth century specifically talk about this so and that's one of the the the, the issues that uh, my current boss Betsy Wiesemann and my former boss Arthur Relock have said yes but if this were pretty standard then we should have uh, written material on it and that component of the the art um, treatises it, it doesn't cover the spiral 
but I I'm still convinced it's there because uh, I would say at least 25% of the, the landscapes that I scrutinize and I will show you what I have. So again, this is COVID. This is the spiral uh, on a uh, see-through and I stick it on my computer and I pull the image in front of this spiral and I can see if it works or not. So I am searching for it. So, uh, which of course is not a, a very scientific um, method, but I think it's, it's, it exists more than people have hitherto considered. Excellent. Um, so it looks like we're running out of time. Um, I have one or two more questions to, to um, uh, shoot quickly. Um, did landscape or, excuse me, did landscape and architectural art continue to be popular in later centuries? Um, yes. And uh, I was briefly talking about the, the, the open air paintings of the, the 19th and early 20th century. There is what the Dutch call the Haagsgeschool, the De Haag School of artists who did go into the landscape and who also painted cityscapes. Uh, people like uh, Jan Weissenbroeg and Ger uh, 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 George Breitner, they, if you look at their art, it is more impressionistic. But the, the treatment of the topic of people going about their daily lives in front of very uh, exact renditions of buildings in the case of Weissenbruch um, is definitely there. So I think the tradition continues. And I also think the uh, appreciation of the Dutch buying public for landscape art definitely continued. Good. And one final question, uh, which could be challenging for you. Do you have a personal favorite when it comes to um, uh, uh, symbolic Dutch painting is, is something that's um, that really um, interests you? Um, I would say it's the same as with music. It depends on your mood that uh, there are days that my favorite painting is a landscape painting. But there are also days when maybe you've had a nasty confrontation with an, an irritating person and you stand in front of uh, Thomas de Keyser's portrait of a gentleman and he has the most benign, relaxing, pleasant face. So um, I'm definitely drawn to realistic e art. If it in, in, sorry, in the two dimensions, two dimensional art, I prefer something that I can more or less recognize. It can be impressionistic, but I have to be able to know what I'm looking at. In uh, sculpture, uh, I tend to like modern sculpture, uh, regardless of, of how realistic it is, because it's more tactile, but a two dimensional single dot on one canvas doesn't do it for me. Fantastic. Well, uh, that puts us at the end. Um, so Henriette, thank you so much. Great presentation. Again, you took us to another time and place. Um, and I'm pretty sure that everyone in the audience really enjoyed it. Um, so thanks for your time. My, my uh, pleasure. Excellent. Um, and thanks to the, uh, um, to the audience for joining us this evening. Um, stay tuned for uh, some announcements for additional programs in this Architecture Everywhere series. We're actually going to pick those up again in June um, with a few interesting topics, um, which I can't say at this moment, but um, I'm sure you'll be excited about those. So uh, with that, um, thanks a lot, everyone, and we'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks.